our Savior, our Jesus. If you're using the blue Bibles there in the pew, then uh, you are on page 1136. 1136 in the blue Bible. As we read uh, this small section, John chapter 7, verses 1 through 13, John doesn't say this, but he's painting a picture for us that after this long and elaborate and detailed uh, teaching about those who would come to Jesus, and he saw 5,000 disciples, those who were following him and seeking depart from him. And he he turns to the disciples and he knows the answers, but he wants them to see in their own hearts, will you also go away? And they stay with him. But then you see the continual sorrow of the Lord. He truly suffered. And we can read the, the scripture and somehow remove ourselves from the reality of what's going on there. The feeling that Jesus must have dealt with. And we see the unbelief of his own brothers. Those who he grew up with. That, that looked up to him as the eldest. And, and yet they, they did not believe in him. And we'll see what that means for you and I today. John chapter 7. Beginning in verse 1. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. He would not walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, and that your disciples also may see the works that you do. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, reveal yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify concerning it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast, I am not going up to this feast yet, because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. However, after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but secretly. Then the Jews looked for him at the feast and said, Where is he? There was much complaining among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. Others said, No, he deceives them. Yet no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. This is God's holy word. See, as John explains this, he's not trying to just give us a travel itinerary of where Jesus is going and where he doesn't go and when he goes and, oh, and he goes here and he goes there. That's not the purpose of what he is speaking to us. He tells us these details to point out to us two things. One is that Jesus is always on time. He always has the right time for everything that he does. And two, he wants us to see and to check ourselves to see if we know the real Jesus. The right time. Throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, we read of people that are always demanding things from him. They're always wanting things from him. They always have a great idea for him. When we saw in John his first miracle, when he turned the water into wine, his mother pressed on Jesus the need. They've run out of wine. Do something. Don't, don't embarrass the, the uh, uh, wedding banquet here. We, we need you to do something. And Jesus rebukes her. He says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. See, it wasn't that he wasn't concerned about his mother or her request or her feelings or the, 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 the uh, embarrassment uh, of the 
ones that were giving the wedding, he, he was making the point that he does everything that pleases the Father. He only does what he sees the Father doing. He isn't to be pressed into our time frame. And even the request of his own mother. Yet he went ahead after rebuking her and did what he intended to do all along. And so he instructed the servants to draw out the water and it had become wine. But it says that Jesus did this not to assuage his mother or to consent to her request. He did this to reveal his glory. See, in Jesus' timing, it's not about your time. It's about the time for him to reveal his glory. When Jesus cleared the temple of the money changers and those who sold the animals there for sacrifice, the Jews demanded a sign. We want to see a miracle right now or we will not recognize that you have any authority. Come on. Show me what you can do. Jesus, he, he would not bend to that. He does not submit to the will of man. And he said to them, the only sign that I will give you is destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. See, and here in our passage today, we read of this again. Jesus' brothers are heading out to Jerusalem. It's the Feast of the Tabernacle. You have to understand, it's a time of celebration for Israel, of celebrating the time that Israel was in the wilderness and how God provided for them for 40 years from his very hand. Every Jew was required to go up to Jerusalem to attend the seventh-day celebration. But see, Jesus' brothers, they're not communicating here any concern about his obligation to attend the festival. It was a given. Every Jew had to go to this festival. But see, that's not their concern. Their concern is that this is the perfect opportunity, Jesus, to promote yourself. See, his brothers were his strategic planners. They were on Team Jesus. And all they cared about is what they could gain from being on Team Jesus. I want to be on the winning team. See, they saw that this was the perfect time. Show them what you can do. They said, depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you do. Heal a few folks. Feed the crowds. Stop wasting your time here in Galilee. You should go show yourself openly in Jerusalem. That's where the action's happening. Now is the time. But they thought they knew what the time was. But Jesus told them in verse 6, My time has not yet come, but your time is always fitting. See, Jesus is speaking of the time in which was coming. He says in Mark chapter 10, We are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. That's Jesus' time. This is just not indicating that he knows what will happen. Oh, I, I, I'm Jesus, I'm I'm the Son of God. I can see what happens. This isn't a display of foreknowledge. See, we have to understand foreknowledge in the Lord is always tied to his word. He speaks the word and it happens. God doesn't just know like he's this all-knowing being who just sits back and watches. Foreknowledge indicates for intent. He knew that this is what was going to happen because he said so. This is the word of the Lord in my time. See, speaking of his death elsewhere, Jesus 
says in John 10, he, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. And Peter confirms this, even after Jesus has risen and ascended, and now on the day of Pentecost, Peter says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. This, Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. See, Jesus is telling his brothers, your time is always fitting. Time for self-promotion. Time for doing what you think is best. Time for you to gain from Jesus. Time for you to, uh, to get what you see is coming to you. And Jesus told his brothers, <clears throat> your time is always fitting. See, the world cannot hate you because you're playing along by the world's rules. Now's the time for me. Now's the time for me to do what I think is best. Now it's time for me to do what I gain from. But it hates me, Jesus said, because I testify concerning it that its works are evil. See, evil, we, we think of as, as like this, this bad, bad thing. It's, it's these bad works. Yes, it is. But evil comes from a heart that is sick, a heart that is turned in on itself. All I think about is myself. James spoke of that when he prayed that we would not lean upon just the comforts of this life because that's what we're geared toward. Who here wants to be uncomfortable? Nobody. Who here wants to get sick? Who wants to be ill? Who wants to be afflicted? Who wants to suffer from, from rejection, from wounds, uh, uh, from others? See, Jesus said that our works are evil because that's what we do to one another. We wound and hurt. We, we grab for that which I need because it's my time. That's the way the world operates. And see, we don't, in ourselves, we, the world, we didn't. We don't like Jesus telling us otherwise. Because the way of Jesus is, is wholly opposite of that. And see, we see what Jesus is really saying when he says, I testify concerning it that its works are evil. All the verbs in that sentence are present tense. They're ongoing. He's not just speaking to those people right there. He's not just talking to his brothers. He's saying that this is the way of the world. This is everyone who follows after you guys and who think it's your time and that it's all about you. It's ongoing. The world today hates Christ Jesus because he came to the cross. And his death upon the cross still speaks today of our evil works that come out of our evil hearts. His cross declares you to be evil in every thought and intention of your heart. Every inclination of the heart is directed towards self and is an opposition to the law of God. And see, Jesus is the only one who could save you. The only one who could come from heaven and die on the cross because 
When the fullness of time came, Paul tells us, God sent forth his son to redeem those who were found guilty under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Do we always have time for ourselves? Self-acceptance, self-promotion, self-care, self-love. But the true disciple of Jesus must follow in the way of the Master. If anyone comes after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. second point that John wants us to see is the real Jesus. So he gives us a litany of other people to see ourselves in. Jesus' brothers, see, they didn't have in their plans his saving work. They didn't care about what he's already communicated over and over was his mission, what he was sent to accomplish. Most likely, it seems that they wanted Jesus to wow the crowds in Jerusalem so that he could be named the king. See, they, they want to be on Jesus' side. I want to be on the winning side. And if you, Jesus, do a few miracles, you know, some of that cool stuff you do, feed them, everybody likes to be fed, then they're going to recognize who you are. They're going to make you king. We can throw off the Roman oppression and be free. Now, why do I say that? Because John tells us in verse 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. I mean, think about the personal suffering and pain that he went through. When those that are closest to you don't believe in you. They have a much better plan for you. And you need to move. You need to get, you need to do this. You need to do that. Anything but believing in him. Now think about that. I'm fairly certain that if you ask Jesus' brothers at the time, do you believe in him? They would have said, of course we believe in him. Well, of course we believe in him. That's why we want him to go to show himself in Judea. See, if, if, if he would just do what we're telling him to do, when we're telling him to do it, everything would be great. Don't you see? Yeah, they believe in Jesus. They believe in a political Jesus. He's a political Messiah who would take up the throne and liberate them from the powers of the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Verse 10 and 11, it tells us, however, after his brothers had gone up to the feast, and he also went up, not publicly, but secretly, then the Jews looked for him at the feast and said, where is he? Now we have to realize this is after all the other things we've already heard. We heard in chapter 5, the Jews had already begun seeking to kill him. They're not saying, where is he? Because you know, we want to get his autograph. Right? We, we want to hang out with Jesus because we really like him. He's kind of cool. No, they're seeking him that they might control him, that they might silence him, that they might put him to death if necessary. See, the Jews, if you ask them, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, sure, we have a lot of beliefs about Jesus. We believe that he's working against God's purposes. What's he doing? Speaking against God's people. See, we don't like what he's saying because he dares tell us who God is. And I already know. He dares hold up the law of God because I, I don't really want to look at that. I'm just satisfied with my observance. Of the law. It's best if we just silence him. See, that's why they were seeking him, to seize him and put him to death. And because the Jews believed their leader. 
And what, what are we told of him? Well, not yet, but later on we'll be told. In John 18, Caiaphas, the leader of the Jews, the high priest, he said, Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. And in verse 12, it says, there was much complaining among the people concerning him. For some said, he is a good man. Others said, no, he deceives the people. See, all these people had strong beliefs about Jesus. Feelings ran deep about Jesus about who he was. Some of the people believe he's a good man. Yeah, Jesus is a good man, like many today. Jesus is kind and gentle, and he only wants to do good. He's harmless. He won't bother you at all. He just wants to give you good things. See, just don't pay too much attention to all that talk about sin and judgment and hell and don't worry about that. He's a good guy. And so those were the people that, that think that they knew Jesus. They had strong beliefs about him. It says that they many were complaining among the people. It's actually the word there, the, the King James does a much better job of capturing it. It's that they murmured about him. They were, they were disagreeing when, with one another. They were saying, no, no, this is Jesus. No, 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 this is Jesus. This, no, no, this is who Jesus is. And others complained that he was deceiving the people. See, they believed, we, we don't need Jesus. I know everything I need to know about God. I've got it all under control. We are just fine without Jesus. He's leading people away from my comfort and my religion. See, God just loves us all and accepts us, as, accepts us just as we are. There's nothing wrong with how I live. Don't tell me about that or what I believe. Don't challenge that. See, they all had strong feelings and beliefs about Jesus. But none of those people believed in Jesus, in the real Jesus. They, they held on to the beliefs that they had about Jesus. See, many will even say today that they believe in Jesus. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But do you believe in the real Jesus? Well, how do we know the real Jesus? Only one way. It's not what you feel about him. It's not what you think he does in your life. It, it, it's how I see the, the spirit do not trust what you think. We know the biblical Jesus because he is presented to us in God's word. The word which cannot fail. The word, word which cannot be broken. Which is not wrong. See, many want to believe in that political Jesus who seeks to establish a kingdom upon this earth a kingdom of freedom and justice. But Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. See, a political Jesus can't save you from your real enemy. A political Jesus could only save you from the external. But Jesus came to testify that your real enemy is you. It's your heart. It's your need for reconciliation to a holy God. Jesus, the good man who just wants to spread love and kindness and good works. See, he can't save you from the ugliness of your sin. Because he's too nice and too, too gentle. He just wants to love you and encourage you and pat you on the back. See, if he's just a good man, he has no more power over sin and death and the grave than you and I do. And if you don't receive every word that Jesus said, which is the very word of God, 
then, then you don't know the way to God any better than I can know it in and of myself. See, that kind of Jesus can't save you. Interestingly enough, only the Jesus that Caiaphas spoke of can save you. See, because a sovereign God who turns the hearts of the king, who can speak through a donkey or through a preacher, same thing. He can speak through whomever he chooses because he's sovereign. Can speak through Caiaphas in the evil of his own heart. And yet Caiaphas was a prophet. He said it was expedient that Jesus would die. It's good. It's beneficial. That word actually means profitable. It's expedient. We could profit from this, from Jesus dying. And he didn't just say that he would die. He said he would die on behalf of the people. That Greek word there is kuper. It's a word on which the whole gospel is based. See, Jesus didn't just die. He didn't die for himself. He didn't die because of himself. He died on behalf of. He died in your place when you believe in him. Only the Son of God, this perfect goodness, spoke only the truth that cannot be heard or understood by those who refuse to receive him and willingly lay down his life to die, to reconcile all of his people to God. See, only that Jesus can save. And so this passage, it challenges us. Even as believers, you can say with great certainty that you know who Jesus is, then you know his word. But see, he's always challenging us. Do you know the real Jesus? Do you accept even his hard words? Or do, will you rather just sit back and, and be content with the Jesus that you picture in your mind? The one that you think that you have decided well, this is how I want Jesus to be. This is how I see him. But only the one and only true Jesus can save. Now, if you've not believed in the true Jesus before, you don't need to know all those things to come to salvation. See, one of the comforts of this passage is that even his brothers did not believe him. And John makes that point very clear on purpose. Because John, remember, he's writing this gospel about 80, 85, 90. Everyone's gone. He alone is left as this old man writing this gospel. But he knows. He knew the end of the story. Even his brothers did not believe him. And yet we read in our, our assurance of pardon, who did Jesus reveal himself to? James, his brother. What did we read of just a few months ago? The gospel.